But I, it's, you are right in that there is we we're go we're like we're in the midst of a monetary revolution and a cultural revolution of such. But yeah. I do, yeah, I I recognize it. Yeah. But I don't know if it scales across everyone with Bitcoin. In that, what I was trying to figure out was: is there a cultural revolution because the kind of people who've been seeking this cultural revolution, like Bitcoin, suits them? Or is it people have found Bitcoin and then it's changed them? I think I think both are true. Yeah, I think both are true. I think Bitcoin, and I think what happens, and this speaks to the point that like uh, I want to say Udi, if I get it, if if it's somebody else, but there's these voices that have criticized like, oh, these Bitcoiners, they're into all these unrelated things, this meat stuff, this other stuff. Like, why do they keep, it's a cult. They keep talking about all these other things. Um, and I, what I think, hap- I think that's a, that's a really shallow critique. And I think what happens is like, people come into Bitcoin and they realize, oh my God, everything I believed about money is wrong. And then there's a question, I wonder what else I believe is wrong. And there's suddenly this like new capacity, this new mental capacity that comes online for some people of like, well, I'm going to just like look into this topic for myself and come to my own conclusions. And that doesn't mean that they get it right. And that doesn't mean there's, you know, there's enormous acquiring true knowledge is a hard and arduous process. It takes a lot of work. It can take research. It can take data. It can, or other other faculties of. But even if they don't get it right, because I feel like this, like in in America, there's been this like uh, this like phrase of like some people would be like do your own research, and then other people would be like no, you can't do your own research. Only the experts. Like you're an idiot. Like you can't know. But I think there's something fundamentally valuable about this process of inquiring into something for yourself, regardless of whether you come to the right conclusion or not, as long as you don't stop inquiring. If you like do a week of research, decide this is it, and then completely like shut your mind to it, like, okay, that can be harmful. But I think somebody even making mistakes, even maybe coming to a conclusion they later reject, is just, it's so important because I feel like it's almost, it's the software of how we avoid, I, I think cultural decay, really. It's how we avoid getting into a place in our society where no one's thinking anymore and we're just accepting narratives and conclusions and secondhand stories as truth with, with no opposition. Uh, and I think that's something Bitcoiners do very well. Um, and I think it's also uh, one one other thing I'll add because, like, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about this topic of Bitcoin culture and what I see in Bitcoin culture. But I want to. I think some people listening might think of Bitcoin culture as just like, oh, Bitcoin culture is just like toxic maxis eating carnivore and yelling at shitcoiners on the internet, and that's what Stephen's talking about when mm-hmm. he says that's not my experience of Bitcoin culture. That's a part of Bitcoin culture. Um, but I think especially in recent years, it has broadened to such a tremendous degree to encompass such a wide variety of people, ideas, and ideologies. Um, so when I talk about Bitcoin culture, just to be clear, I'm not talking about that, I think that narrow slice, but what I experience as like a much broader view of Bitcoiners. Yeah. And I think different people get attached to different parts of that. Yes. You know, so I'm I'm uh, really drawn to the idea of time. Just really, I mean, yeah. I'm 45 at the end of this month. Yeah, I'm drawn Happy to birthday. the idea. Well, not yet, but I'm drawn to this idea of time because it is scarce. Yeah, and I'm drawn to this idea that you know people die in their 40s all the time, and yeah, you know, more so in the 50s, even more so in the 60s. But but it happens. Like, yeah. you you don't you don't know when it's gonna yes. it's gonna end. But I'm really compelled into it and I, I i think about time in through a bitcoin lens mm-hmm. in a couple of ways <laughs> you know firstly financially when am i set up so i can not work <laughs> and secondly <laughs> you how- do this because you love it no but no actually because we talked about it beforehand like i'm approaching yeah. you know th- there will come a time in the not too distant future i will 
have my retirement or Bitcoin retirement. I think you have to. Yeah. But I'm constantly thinking about time and how I use time and how I want to use time. So I was saying to Danny beforehand, I used to work in advertising, right? Yeah. Nobody quits advertising. Mm. They stay in it forever until they die or until they hit 65 retirement age, some, some later. And I had an agency and it had its peak. We had 40 staff. We had a £3 million turnover. It was pretty good. But we were definitely thinking, how do we get to 10 million? And we definitely would have thought after that, how do you get to 50 million? So on. He yeah. never would have stopped. I don't think like that anymore. With this, with my Bitcoin, I'm like, when does my Bitcoin get me to the point where I can slow down, do yeah. less? Still might do the podcast, yeah. just might not travel. That you I can know? understand. And I don't know. Well, I can't tell you, Steve. I can't tell you. Is that just my age? Yeah. Yeah, does that happen to everyone? Or is it the money? Because I feel like I own a form of money where I've... I've crossed that certain period of time where every four years should mean I should be able to not worry about money again. Like I should yeah. be able to pay for my house, pay for my things, pay for my kids, rather than keep them to feed the feast. So I don't know which it is. And so I, I feel like that speaks to almost a, like a value that is embedded in the Bitcoin community. Like when I relate and I look at the Bitcoin community, I generally, generally find a group of people that – like it is not as much concerned with like that previous model you described in advertising. That's just kind of like, we're just gonna grow forever and not question it. There's effectively no stopping point. There's effectively, there's not, it's just growth for growth's sake. Yeah. Um, and this isn't me demonizing like economies need to grow, you know, et cetera. But I think in Bitcoin, there's an inquiry of like, what is the role of money and what is more important than money? What are the values? What are the things that we have in life that matter to us that like transcend, you know, just, just money or just our career success. And, um, I think Bitcoiners are concerned with that. I think, uh, a lot of them like, and this is the thing, I think Bitcoin is in, in many ways a means to an end. Um, and you can see this in the in the phrase like fix the money, fix the world, right? Bitcoiners say this all the time. But like embedded in that phrase, the goal is fixing the world. It's not having Bitcoin at a million dollars. People might think that the road to, to fixing the world is having a different monetary system and that'll fix a lot of the problems. But the thing that Bitcoiners are really after in that statement, and I think in general, is this social societal change. They're looking at the world we inhabit right now and saying, like, this isn't this isn't working right. And there are maybe values I hold that aren't reflected in society, or there's values I didn't hold that have like caused a lot of problems in my life. Like my life has not gone the way I've wanted because I was valuing these other things. Can you and give me examples? Like, uh, like I, I mean, simple example based on what you said is like someone who just works all the time and never sees their kids and just mm -hmm. is on the fiat treadmill. I think that's a simple example. It could also be somebody who um, like gave all their decision-making authority away to other people in their life, whether those are experts or their family or whoever, but like they didn't, they didn't think for themselves. They didn't stand in their own two shoes and live their life as ultimately like they wanted to live it. Even if maybe that took a little inquiry to figure out what is the life I even want to live. But um, I almost think most people don't really get to live the life they want to live. I would agree with you 100%. You know, yeah. um, right now, and most people don't know the life yes. they want to live. It's not even that like they're dreaming of doing this thing and like the system is just preventing them. It's literally like they're not even clear on what that life would be. So back when I worked in advertising, yeah. I would tell you I love my job. Yeah. I absolutely love yeah. my job. I would get up at 5 in the morning or 6 in the morning. I'd get the train to London. I would do it and I'd come back and see my kids before they went to bed, have my dinner and go to bed. And I, I was convinced I loved my job. But now when people say that, I was like, I'm like, do you, do you really love your job? What Do you love it more than going down the pubs with, with your mates? Do you love it more than going on holiday? Do you love it more than having sex with your wife? Do you love it more than hanging out with your kids? Do you love it more than going to the gym? Like, I can list 10 things I think you love more than your job. So why is your job taking up like 80, 90% yeah. of your life? And I, like, I convinced myself I sure. love my job. I, did, I didn't. I knew when I quit, I fucking quit. Yeah. Um, 
But right now, not entirely, because you know we're having questions about the future, but I'm definitely living the life I want to live, yeah. mostly. I'd say 60, 70% there. That's pretty good. Yeah. It's much more than most people ever get. But Bitcoin arguably did that. Yeah. That's, exactly. what, that's what Bitcoin did. Yeah, that's what Bitcoin did. Yeah. We figured it out. <laughs> no, but it, but it did it in that it gave me the breathing. It's not yes. that I got to do the podcast. It gave me the br financial breathing yes. space. A f one four-year cycle, that first tour of duty, it gave me that breathing space. Yeah. And now it's like, okay, I can make decisions. And yeah, if we have another run over the next yeah, few months or a year, it's going to change everything. Yeah. And there's like, so there's a way, and I think that's very real that like having, you know, being financially constrained versus having financial breathing room can allow you the time and space to sit down and reevaluate things, make different choices, like construct the, the work or, you know, kind of some like external life in some ways that you want. Uh, but then there's even this other, this other level, which I think is independent from those more like external concerns of just like, how does one even, even know? How does one even come upon what, what they really want in life? What is meaningful for them? What, what sort of life and what sort of relationships, what sort of people, what sort of values would, I, I honestly would use the phrase like bring themselves into harmony with themselves. Uh, I think for most people, we live a there's a there's a very divided life where kind of like you were describing with advertising, um, you con like people consciously think they want and are satisfied by one thing, uh, but it, it conflicts with their actual nature, their actual self. But they don't even know where that actual self is located, much less what it thinks. Um, I think I think there's two components of it: yeah. one, financial breathing room. Sure. Is really it's critical. Is it's critical. Important. It's important. Yeah. And I, because I've seen the opposite recently yes. in Argentina and yeah. particularly in Lebanon. And it's devastating. Um, I mean, the, there is a brain drain on these countries yeah. where the young people are leaving because there is no future. Yeah. And they have to leave if they can. So I think one is the, the financial aspect, having that ability to breathe and, and plan. You talked about that in the past, you know, with the volatility of these yeah. prices, you can't plan yeah. on a, in an economic environment. But um, I think the second thing is the the death of ego, which I think other some people struggle with yeah. in different ways. And that ego could manifest itself in how you want people to see you, you know, versus how you know the things that you think are, are meaningful for yeah. your life. Yeah, and I, probably both. Just bullshit. I couldn't agree more. You know, we all get, you know what, we all are born and adopt a conditioned sense of self. It's like inevitable, like just being a human. You're raised in a culture, by a family, in a society, and you're taught to want and expected to behave in certain ways. And this forms like a simulated sense of self. You have like ego, you, you know, I use that kind of just broadly. Like you have this almost just like the simulation of you. And, you know, people may live their whole lives just, um, you know, at the beck and call of this concept. But it's just a, it's, it's just a kind of an accumulated weight of conditioning. And like, if you're lucky, if you're so lucky, uh, something happens in your life that cracks that shell. Often tragedy, often, often hardship. It usually, it, if everything's going well, you don't question it. it. It's usually when things are going not so well. And this suddenly interrupts your narrative of yourself. And if you're so lucky, you know, you look into that crack for a second and it's a, it's a moment, a crack in the shell. And it's a moment where you can kind of restructure yourself in hopefully a way which is more authentic, but also like more, more vitalizing, more like life-giving. Um, because I just think like, and, and I just think, you know, it's, this is just one of the tragedies of the world is like uh, so many people, so, so many people living uh, like a simulated life, uh, just a conditioned life. Um, not, and, you know, I don't say that to diminish the, the difficulty in going from A to B, but it's profound.